Amen. First Timothy chapter 2. Uh, you have some of, of the most controversial verses uh, in uh, 1 Timothy that are uh, hotly debated as to the practical application of them that you'll find. And we'll get to some of those verses, especially verses 8 through 15, in dealing with the roles of men and women within the church and what that role is and the practical application of that as uh, revealed in the scriptures here. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, I mean, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 1, he says, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Let's stop right there, and we'll go further in a moment. So as he uh, continues this letter, he says, I want uh, supplications and prayers and intercessions be made for all people. You know, the Bible's telling us here that we should pray for those who don't pray for themselves. We not only pray for ourselves, but we are to pray for those who don't pray for themselves. We are to intercede for other people now he uses uh, prayers supplication and intercessions here what what are the differences in those words as as it relates to prayer what is supplications Supplications, yes, asking, uh, petitioning God. Supplications. That, that's uh, the word there to, uh, to bring something before God. Prayers, of course, we understand that concept of, uh, of talking to God, and we'll see in a moment um, the, the proper protocol, procedure, as it were, for prayer. Intercessions. What does intercessions mean? Right. Praying on behalf of, of someone else, um, praying for or someone else in the sense of uh, we need to pray for one another. James reminds us when he, uh, when he does the uh, announcements that we are to be praying for one another. That's intercession. Praying for ourselves and praying for one another. We make intercession for one another. That means to go on the behalf of another. That's what the word is referring to. Making intercession on behalf of someone else. So there are the intercessions that are to be made and the giving of thanks made for all men. That's the word there, men, for mankind. And the reason why I'm pointing that out is because later on, another word is going to be used for men, and it's going to help us better understand some passages in this chapter. All humans is what he's referring to there. Uh, Mankind, the, the generic word for humanity. We are to be praying for individuals of this world. Verse 2, for kings... All who are in authority, why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So we are to be praying for those who are in authority. And that even includes those that you don't vote for. You may oppose politically. But we are to be praying for them. And uh, that we might, as a, and he's talking here when he says we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. This is, this is the end result and this is the goal of praying for our leaders so that we in society 
will have a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. That, is, that should be the goal of praying for those who are in authority. So on a practical level, seeing the, the wording here in verse 2, what should we be praying for as American citizens? For the president, governors, those in authority, um, praying uh, for police officers, others, civil, civil servants, we would call them. Praying for, of course, we do this often, pray for our military. Um, now, on a practical level also, in, as Americans praying, we're praying for the president, we're praying for those in authority. What should we be praying for that relates to a peaceable life with godliness and reverence? What are some practical things there? Uh, say again. Close. Close. Peace. Right, peace, close the gaps so, so we can have peace. That's one thing. That's a practical thing. What else? Well, I think it starts with the kind of obvious that we want to build come to know God, to know the truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would be uh, one of that. That's the way I would start them off. And then also I'd be praying that their eyes would be opened also to That, I mean, that is exactly the, the practical things I was looking for. The, the practical aspect of, uh, of things in our society that uh, we need to be praying for uh, to help us to have a peaceable life and all godliness and reverence. Now, reverence would be towards who? God. So we want a society that's reverent toward God. We want a society that is a life that has godliness as the rule of it and have peace in that life, not being persecuted for speaking out against certain things. Like uh, some, some brethren in some nations have the problem of dealing with even having an assembly like this. It, this would be illegal. What we're doing this morning in some nations of the world. They don't have that peace. They don't have that freedom. And they have to meet in secret. So we, we want to pray for that to, to be a prevailing thing. And you, you think about the time in which Paul wrote this, how it was becoming increasingly more and more dangerous in that society to be a Christian. And so you were praying for those in authority to come to realize some things. And like you said, for their salvation. For their salvation. We want people to be saved because, and this ties in to verse 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. We, we want those from the top to the bottom to be saved. That would include the president, his family. Uh, we want uh, the man on the street to be saved. So we we want that because God wants that. God wants all men to be saved. And having a reverence in, in authority, having godliness in authority, having the quest for a peaceable life in authority. You have those in a, who are in authority who have those qualities of, of, of godliness 
uh, in their rule, in their uh, authority, that will make for a better life. The unborn will be respected. I mean, that, that goes, that's a practical aspect of it. Uh, it is ungodly to slaughter the unborn in abortion. That's ungodly. Uh, homosexuality is ungodly. And uh, things that go along with that. Uh, um, just we want to pray for things to, to turn around for the better. And verse 3 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. This is good. This is what God wants. This is acceptable. This is what we are to be praying for. Uh, verse 2. So it, it's, it goes back to the whole concept, as I said earlier. It matters not who it is that's in authority. We need to be praying for them. We need to be praying for these things to prevail. A quiet and peaceable life, godliness and reverence. So that's what we want. This is uh, acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, verse 4, who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Notice how coming to a knowledge of the truth is connected with being saved. You cannot be saved without knowing the truth. What did Jesus say in John 8 and verse 32? You shall know the truth. Truth shall set you free. And so Peter talks about uh, purifying our souls in obedience to the truth. And therefore we have um, the truth there that tells us about the gospel, having that knowledge of it, and then obedience to it, that brings about salvation. And notice verse 4 here, God desires all to be saved. That word all is uh, very important. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. What does Peter say? The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to, rep to repentance. So we see here the desire of, of God is for all people uh, to be saved. We have to come to the truth and through that truth believe and obey. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. You have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. And sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Purifying our souls by the blood of Christ in obedience to the truth that brings about salvation. Christ died for all. God wants all to be saved. And therefore, uh, He made salvation available to anyone who is willing to do what it takes to be saved, believe the truth, and obey that truth. Now, there is a, a theology known as Calvinism, started by John Calvin. Well, no, excuse me, it didn't start by John Calvin. He made it into a system. It was basically started earlier than that, by Augustine. Uh, John Calvin made it popular and it became known as Calvinism. And what he taught in his theology is that God only wants certain people to be saved and Jesus died for that certain people, that elect, he called them. But everyone else who's lost, God doesn't desire them to be saved. He chose before the world began this group of people to be saved. And they are His people and they will be saved and they really don't have a choice in the matter. They're predestined to salvation without any choice in the matter. The others are predestined to be lost and they have no choice in the matter. And Calvinism is something that affects pretty much every denomination. They have some form or variation of Calvinism in it. And uh, verses like this here in verse 4 destroy that theology. Because God wants all men to be saved. They won't because not all will believe and obey. But His desire is to have them all saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And Christ made that sacrifice available to all. 
That's why we are to go into all the world and preach to everyone because God wants all men to be saved. And that's the purpose of preaching and spreading the gospel. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. John the Apostle says, My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our song, ours only, but also for the whole world. Jesus died for the whole world, but those who will benefit from His sacrifice are those who believe and obey Him. And that's the key to uh, benefiting from that sacrifice. So all can make that choice to, to serve Him and to, to make the changes that are necessary if they really want to. And it comes down to a matter of choice. It really does. What, what did Joshua say in his farewell address? Joshua 24 and verse 15. Choose this day whom you will serve. I'm watching a, a very interesting documentary. I already went through it once and I'm going through it again. It's about this man from Australia who uh, was having some health problems. And he was uh, overweight. And he went on a 60-day juice fast in which he juiced all his vegetables. Put them in this juicer and, and went on this fast in which his meals consisted of drinking vegetables. Well, he lost close to 80-something pounds. He, he got off his medication. And it just really helped him a lot. And he, and he came across this man that was a lot bigger than him, 400 pounds plus bigger than him. This guy was a truck driver, had had health issues and was basically a walking time bomb as far as could lose his life. The point is, this man said, I'm willing to make some changes. And he did, and it wasn't easy. Long story short, the man now, who was 400 and close to 430 pounds, is now 220 pounds because he made changes. He could do it. The point, the, the point is choice. And it doesn't matter how far gone you are. You would think someone who's 400 plus pounds, that's too far gone. There, there's no way. But he was willing to do it. Willing to change. And it matters not. When it comes, you put that in the spiritual realm. And it matters not how far gone you are. If you're willing to turn to Christ, do what's right, then the benefits of uh, salvation will uh, be yours. So we see that here, uh, that God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. There's that word all again. To be testified in due time. So God... Our Savior, verse 5, is one God. There is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. Now, mediator, what's that? A go-between is pretty self-explanatory there in the verse. One mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. There's one God, the Bible teaches that from cover to cover. That one God consists of three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Godhead, there is a mediator within the Godhead, the man, Christ Jesus. See, God and men there in verse 5 were separated due to sin. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, sin separates us from God. There had to be someone to, to be the mediator, the go-between, and that was the man, Christ Jesus. And by the way, this shows here, this verse, that when Jesus ascended back to the Father, He still had His humanity. We actually talked about that in our sermon uh, this morning. He's, he's in a glorified condition. Our bodies will be conformed to His glorious body. 
when he returns. So he still, when Jesus took on flesh, when he left heaven and went back to earth, excuse me, he left earth and went back to heaven, I got that backwards, after his resurrection, he left the earth and went back to heaven, he did not give his humanity up. What does the Bible say in Acts chapter 1? He ascended into heaven, was received up into a cloud. So he is still the man, Christ Jesus, but he's in a glorified condition, glorified state. And so he has that work as a mediator between God and men. What's another word that we find, especially in the book of Hebrews, that deals with this? Besides the word mediator, what, what's another word? The book of Hebrews uh, really emphasizes this. What? High priest. High priest. Who are the priests in the New Testament? Christians. Every Christian is a priest. And there's only one high priest, Christ. Only one mediator. Look at uh, Hebrews 2 and verse 17. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. He's the high priest. That's that mediator. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 14. Hebrews 4, 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Mediator, uh, the high priest. And so you, you find that concept emphasized over and over throughout uh, the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 8 and verse 1. Hebrews 8 and verse 1. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens. So Jesus Christ is our mediator, only one mediator, between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There is a doctrine within Catholicism that says that Mary is a co-mediatrix with Jesus and that you can pray through Mary to get to the Father. That is nowhere taught in the Bible. In fact, this verse right here contradicts that. There's only one mediator. It's not Jesus and His mother. It's Jesus. There is no other mediator but He. So that means we don't have to go to a confessional booth and confess our sins to the clergy, to some man in a booth. When when we approach God, we approach God through Jesus Christ, who is our mediator, who is our high priest, and we receive the forgiveness of sins um, when we do that. Look at verse 6. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. For which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. A ransom. What's a ransom? How do you define a ransom? A payment for someone's life. Someone is kidnapped, the kidnappers demand a ransom. The ransom is to be paid for the release uh, of uh, that individual or individuals. So Jesus gave himself 
a, a ransom for all. There's that concept of God wanting all to be saved. Jew and Gentile, every human being. To be testified in due time. So Jesus is that ransom for sin. He paid the price in His blood. He died on the cross and, and paid His price, the, the price of uh, salvation, by His blood. Look at Acts chapter 20. In verse 28, Acts 20 and verse 28, Paul writing to the elders at Ephesus. He says, Therefore take heed to yourself and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. So the ransomed are the Christians in the church ransomed by the blood of Jesus Christ. He gave Himself, He shed His blood to uh, save others, to pay, make that payment for sin so that others could be set free uh, from the uh, consequence of sin. It's like a person uh, giving themselves as a ransom. Take me instead. You have someone who has hostages and someone says, take me instead. I'll step in. You take me. Do to me as you wish. Let these others go. And that's exactly what Jesus, in essence, did. Take me. And he went to the cross for us. Verse 7, For which I am appointed, Paul says, a preacher and an apostle. A preacher is one who heralds forth, forth a message. An apostle is one sent forth uh, with uh, authority by the one that is sending him. So he is an apostle and a preacher. And he's speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So Paul <clears throat> primarily taught to the Gentiles. He was going to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And he, you know, did teach the Jews, but the Jews, for the most part, were rejecting the message. And therefore, he went to the Gentiles, and as a result of that, the gospel spread um, beyond the borders of Israel uh, tremendously as he was uh, preaching to those Gentiles. Any questions or comments about verses 1 through 7 as, as we've looked at these verses? So we see here that, that prayer is for all people. You know, the one thing that you can do for everyone, if you can't do anything else for them, is pray. Pray for them. If, there, if there's nothing else you can do, if you don't have any means of helping them um, physically, if they need physical help, even spiritually, if they need spiritual help, but they're not, they're not willing to do what they need to do, and they won't listen to you anymore. They, if you've gone to them to talk to them, they won't listen anymore. They can't stop you from praying for them. And that's the one thing that makes prayer so powerful. That, that, that's the one thing that can continue on even when they say, I don't want to hear it anymore. Okay, I'll be praying for you. I'll be praying for you. So prayer is that uh, thing that can continue on for all people this is what God wants this is acceptable to God God wants all men to be saved there's only uh, one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus and by the way that does away with the whole concept of the clergy system within denominations that say you've got to go through us to get forgiveness of sins or you can't you can't be right with God you've got to talk to us you got to go through our system no there's only one mediator only one and that's Jesus Christ and those who or his people compose the church and so Jesus is the one who gave himself a, a ransom for all so God wants all men to be saved that destroys Calvinism and 
He gave himself a ransom for all. That verse destroys Calvinism. Uh, in the, the word tulip, which is an acrostic of Calvinism, the L represents limited atonement. That the death of Christ was limited only to the ones who were going to be saved. And that's just not so. From these verses here and many others. Okay, verses 8 through 15, as I said earlier, these are some of the uh, verses that are, are hotly debated as to what, what's being said here and rejected by so many because uh, of uh, some apparent misunderstandings about uh, the order of things in the church. But we see here in verses 8 through 15, the conduct of a mixed assembly of males and females. What is the church to do when spiritual activity like prayer is going on when there are males and females pre- present? Now look at verses 8 through 15. I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to learn in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. So verses 8 through 15 are, are some interesting verses here. Now let's look at verse 8. We're going to spend a little time on that, and we're going to have to carry this, this section over to, to, to next week because of the, our time limit. But he says, I desire therefore that men... Pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now, remember I told you to remember the word men there in verse 1. And also the word men there in verse 5 of, the, of chapter 2. This is where understanding a little bit about the original language helps. And anyone can can study that and check that out with the resources that are available to us. The word for men in verse 1 is the word for mankind. Humans. Verse 5, the word for men there is the word for mankind, for humans. In verse 8, the word for men there is a nair for males. Males. He's using this word to denote male leadership within the church. So he's talking about men as a gender, not mankind. Desire, therefore, that mankind pray everywhere. But he's being more specific here in verses 8 through 15. Because in the context of verses 8 through 15, he's dealing with the assembly. The assembly of males and females, Christians, in an assembly situation. The men are to pray everywhere. The males. That means leadership of the males. And that the men are to lead prayers. It would be wrong. It would be incorrect. According to what we're reading here, and we'll get into this deeper next week, for a woman to lead a prayer in a mixed assembly. Now, that's politically incorrect in our society, but that's what the Bible teaches concerning uh, the principle of male leadership within the church. And we have this here, the, the men are to be the ones leading the prayers, not that they're more righteous than the women. A lot of times in the congregations, you have women who are, are, are the, make up the predominant number of the congregation, but they are... Um, the ones that are uh, the hard workers within the church. But this is God's will, and He gives a reason why in verses 13 through 15. Here's the reason why this is to happen. Here's the reason why men are to take the leadership in this. 
We'll just go ahead and read verse 13 through 15. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Order of creation. God created man first, then he created woman from man. Verse 14, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Both Adam and Eve sinned, but the point is that Adam wasn't deceived when the temptation took place, but Eve was. She was deceived and fell into transgression. But they both sinned, of course. We understand that from other passages. So here is the order of things when it comes to the principle of male leadership. The Bible makes it very clear that men are to take the lead. Women cannot be pastors according to the Bible. Women cannot be elders in the church. They cannot be deacons in the church because the qualifications of elders and deacons within the Bible is the husband of one wife, the male. There in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. And so we see this here as God's arrangement. God's pattern for the church. And of course, this is in no way, shape, or form saying that that men and women are not equal. We are one in Christ. Galatians 3, uh, 27 and 28. Male and female are one in Christ. But there is a function and a role within the church that has to be respected for the church to function properly. Now verse 8 says here, Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In the Bible, when it's talking about hands, and it's not literally talking about your your physical hands, what are they talking about? When it says your hands are doing something. In the book of Ecclesiastes, when it says, whatever your hands find to do, do it with your might. What is that referring to? Hmm? Put your, put, putting your mind in. Yes, your mind's engaged. Exactly. Everything that's involved there. So the, the hands and doing things with your hands is referring to your conduct, what you do. And so uh, sometimes the question is, as asked, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, it, does the lifting up of holy hands take place in churches of Christ? The answer is yes, but not literally. We lifted up holy hands this morning, not literally. Because think about this. When he's talking about your holy hands, are your hands the only part of your body that's supposed to be holy? No. So when he's talking about lifting up holy hands, he's talking about lifting up holy lives to God. Because your hands are not the only thing that's supposed to be holy. You're supposed to be holy from head to toe. And he's using hands... To represent the whole. It's synecdoche. It's a figure of speech known as synecdoche. Where a part of something refers to the whole thing. Someone buys a new car, you go out there and say, I like your new wheels. You're just talking about their wheels? No, you're talking about their car, but you say wheels to denote the whole vehicle. Just using the illustration of a hand. If uh, If I say to someone, could you give me a hand up here to move this table are they just going to offer one hand no they're going to come up here and they're going to help me move the table so hands hand represents what you do so when it talks about lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting he's not necessarily talking about the literal lifting up of hands but lifting up our lives when we come together and assemble together and this is a principle we saw in the prophets When we come together to worship God on the first day of the week, it is after a life of living holy before God all week long the week before. And we come together as God's people and we worship God and we offer up to God praise and worship out of a life 
that is holy. Holy conduct is what he's talking about. The lifting up of hands here is referring to that. Now, look at James. Give you another illustration. James chapter 4 and verse 8. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. It's talking about being sorrow, having sorrow over sin. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Now, I want you to look at verse 8. Hebrews, excuse me, James 4 and verse 8. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Now, is our hands the only part of our body that's supposed to be cleansed? No. Is He talking about literally washing your hands? No. He's talking about your conduct, cleaning up your conduct. What do we say sometimes? Clean up your act. That's what He's saying here. You've got to clean up your act. Clean up your conduct. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your heart, you double-minded. He's going back to, to the source, and the source is your heart. Your hands are your productivity. What you do, your conduct, the source of what you do is your heart. So you've got to get your heart purified. And when you do that, you draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. So hands there, when he says you cleanse your hands, he's referring to your conduct. That's the same thing that Paul is talking about here in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8 when he says lifting up holy hands without wrath, without wrath and doubting. It's lifting up holy lives. So if someone asks you the question today, hey, did you lift up holy hands in worship? The answer should be yes. And it should be modified with, here's what the Bible says about it. But most people believe it's, it's doing this. So, you know, they have their hands up during worship. Now, there are several different postures for prayer that you find throughout the Bible. And you can stand when you pray. You can kneel when you pray. You can be flat on the ground when you pray. You can sit when you pray. You can bow your head when you pray. And sometimes lifting up hands in prayer was literally done as they would petition God. They would stand and lift their hands up to God and pray to God. But what you have under consideration here because he's talking about holy hands without wrath and doubting, he's talking about your lives, your conduct. And so the the hands being lifted up is not necessarily uh, lifting literal hands but lives devoted to God. And those are the ones, in the context there, verse 8, the men who are leading are men who are living holy lives before God. Now, time is up. We'll be uh, studying further verses 8 through 15 uh, next week, Lord willing.